Requiem the Restoration Church, a place of new beginnings and hope for the future. Uh, we want to welcome all our first-time guests and our online viewers. We thank God for each and every one of you. Um, I want to give honor to Pastor Huey um, and Pastor Nate and my lovely wife and children. Um, thank God for them. Um, and I want to thank God for saving me and giving me a new nature to serve him. And I pray that every one of us in this sanctuary experience a fresh, new life in him today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And so I want to actually, um, I had a testimony from my, from my kids when they came back from camp. You know, they said they didn't want to leave. I said, wow, you didn't want to leave? You didn't miss me? And they said they didn't want to leave. I thought that was powerful. Um, and what it did, it impacted in their lives. Amen? Um, and so I thank God for our leadership team over our youth, Mosaic, Pastor Chris, um, and Ariel. We thank God for them leading our youth. They are definitely doing an awesome and amazing job. They are doing an amazing job. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us, your power, your strength, and your might. I thank you for changing us, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for giving us yourself. You gave us yourself, Lord. So grateful. The things that I've done and said, Lord God, I didn't deserve what you have given me. And I still don't deserve it today, Lord. But I am forever grateful for that. I am forever grateful. And I have hope that when you came inside of me, Lord God, at the worst of my life, you came inside of me, Lord. Surely you haven't deserted me today. You haven't left me alone today. You haven't forsaken me today. I have hope for my future because of what you've already done. So I pull on and draw from what you've done for me. And I pray, Lord God, this message impact your people and change them forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You can keep going. Keep playing. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit. I forgive every word. Every word that was spoken to me. That offended me. Before we get into this word, Lord God, I'm feeling led that the Lord wants you to just release before you hear the word. Forgive. Let it go. Forgive yourself and forgive others. The shame, the guilt, the condemnation, let it go. Let it go. The blood of Jesus be against you, Satan. You cannot do it to God's people. All the shame, the regret, let it go, says the Lord. Release yourself. I've forgiven you. That's enough to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Let it go. Be still. Be still. Stop fighting within yourself. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Ooh. Ah, y'all ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Man, you just got to obey him, you know? 
You do what he says. It always works out when you obey the Lord. All right. All right. Let's get into this word. Today's title of today's message is words, the building blocks for life. Biology is the study of life. All life comes from God. All living things, non-living organisms and living organisms are made up of cells. Cells are the basic building blocks of all living things. The human body is comprised of one trillion cells. The discovery of the cell in, 1960, in 1665 by uh, Robert Hooke published in my, he, he published a book called Micrographia, a book filled with drawings and descriptions of the organisms he viewed under the recently invented microscope. The invention of the microscope led to the discovery of the cell. The cell is the structure and the functional unit of all known living organisms. It is the smallest unit of, of an organism that is classified as living. And it's often called the building blocks of life. We are made up of cells. Cells are made up of atoms. Atoms are the building block of the cell. One cell have Estimated one trillion atoms. Y'all get that? Our body hold one trillion cells. One cell hold one trillion atoms. Ain't that phenomenal? In 1888, in 1808, chemist John Dalton developed a very persuasive argument that led to an amazing realization. Perhaps all matter, all of it, stuff, things, objects, is made up of tiny little bits fundamental bits, indivisible bits, atom bits. He thought if I isolated a single element and chopped it in half, then, cho then chopped those halves in halves, and so on and so on, would I eventually find the smallest possible bit of element that could no longer be chopped? Or would it go on for infinity? All right, let me, let me get my nerd out this bit. <laughs> this is really good, saints. And breakthrough technology in the atom has taken the study of the atom into discoveries and inventions. The periodic, periodic table, how many of y'all remember biology? Y'all used to love biology. Then they used to get too deep, you know? <laughs> then they got past my brain, you know what I'm saying? I'm like. Uh, but the discovery of the atom also breakthroughs in the, uh, the periodic table, in energy and technology, the atomic bomb. How many, how many of y'all remember how the atomic bomb works? It's the splitting of the atom. Amen? And so uh, the most frequent breakthroughs in atom is nanotechnology. That's the ability to control the atoms. Amen. Nanotechnology, man, is, is crazy uh, as you do your study. But I am going to tie this to a revelation that the Lord showed me years ago. One atom consists of proton, neutrons, and electrons. Amen. When scientists attempt to analyze protons, neutrons, and electrons, they saw continuous movement. They behaved as if they were sound waves, sound waves. So you have a proton and a neutron, which is a positively charged atom, a positively charged element, and a negatively charged element, and they are together, right? And then the electrons kind of orbit that. And atoms are in everything, everything has atoms, and all uh, in, inside of an atom is a proton, neutron, and electron. Well, well, I tied this, I have a theory myself. If everybody else can come up with a theory, so can I. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. So science complements, to me, science complements God's infinite capabilities. 
Amen. It, science, it, when science is used to disprove God, that's when I'm like, eh, 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 eh. but I love science because it actually tells of how beautiful and how intelligent and how organized and how structured our God is. Amen. In Romans chapter one, verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, God invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood by from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Since Adam's are all since atoms and in, is in all things, protons, neutrons and electrons are the physical evidence of the creative voice of God. In Genesis chapter one, the Bible says, God, let there be what? Let there be light. And there was. So when I was studying quantum physics and I seen how at the smallest level, um, scientists can only relate to what it's what it looked like as sound waves. It brought memories, it brought thoughts about how God created the world. And the Bible says that God stood on the corner of nothing and nowhere and spoke, let there be, and it was, right? And so in John chapter one, verse four, the NIV says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that ever that has ever that has been made. In him was life and that life is the light of all men. So the word of God created the world. Right. Sound waves went out. Through the inspiration of God and created what we see today. And the Lord showed me, gave me this revelation that the electrons, neutrons and protons is a result of God speaking. Let me give you some more scripture. Hebrews chapter one, verse three, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. So how are all things upheld? By his word. Amen. So it actually confirms what, and, and, and further detail of the atom would, would, would be the study of quantum physics. It, it confirms quantum physics. The word does. Quantum physics is the study of atoms. His word is the building blocks of life. We use his word to we use words to convey thoughts, to communicate ideas, to ex it's an expression of tools. We inspire and motivate. Words have creative ability. Amen. Words are also spiritual. In John chapter six, verse 63, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus is God's word. It is what's holding everything together. Jesus' words gives life. What does that mean? God, God has the ability to reverse the effects of death. God's word has the ability to reverse the, de the decomposition of death, decomposing nature of death, the deterioration of death. God's word has life in it. Right. But he said they are spiritual. God's word is spiritual. And I submit to you that all words are spiritual. I believe words have a motivation behind them that affects us. It actually changes us and affects us all the way down to the cell level. Oh, you don't believe me? Let somebody cuss you out. Would that change and affect you? 
When someone says something negative to you, why does it affect us so much? Why do we have to respond? And I submit to you, it hit more than just your brain. It hit more than just your feelings. It's actually affecting your whole being. This is why you feel, unco- you feel like you got to say something back. And it takes much power, much power, not to say nothing. That's the true exercise of power. It's the ability not to respond, not just to respond. Really, responding and letting someone else's words control you or letting someone else stimulate your emotion and action is control. That's too much control. The only person to have that much control over you is Jesus. Amen? Jesus' words are supposed to move you. But this is why I say words are spiritual, because they hit more than just your brain. All right. And this is the negative effects of it. Of it. Your deepest hurts. It ain't come from some, what somebody did. It can. But most of our deepest hurts came from when somebody said something to us. Amen. When you remember, if somebody call you ugly, you go check that mirror. Try to look at yourself objectively. You know, you know, I ain't that ugly, man. I ain't. <laughs> Words, the Bible, no, not, the, not the Bible, the world says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a flat out lie. Mm-hmm. Words, Jesus said, the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. That means that's the taking away of life. Death is the taking away of life. Right. It's 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 the um, it's the opposite of who God is. Most of us, we've been trained and shaped by death. Right. I mean, I, I, it's amazing. You see the most beautiful woman. Right. The most handsome man. Somebody somebody still think they ugly. And you're beautiful. You're gorgeous. What has been what what how has uh, that person been shaped? Somebody said something. Or they didn't say what needed to be said. Now, what I love is what we're going to do today. Is we're, going to re- we're going to reverse the effects of darkness. Why? Because not just everything in you was created by God, right? In- including the protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? So they're used to God, why they came from God. I confirm that everything exists comes from God. Everything that has life comes from God. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus said that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. Words are spiritual. This is why you have to be careful what you say to yourself and what you say to others. I remember hurting my, 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 my little girls and my barely saying anything that I didn't I didn't think that was harmless. Right. And coming to here years later, you said this, Dad. Lord, I'm sorry. Man, I, I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to hurt, especially my kids. Amen. Right? But you have to be aware that your words have power, and it, it is affecting and shaping people's reality. Amen? Amen? So let's keep moving forward. Jesus says, the flesh, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. His words causes change in our life. His words is the building blocks for life. Matthew, Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 23 says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe what they say will happen, it will be done for them. And I want to remind you of the Jesus created the mountain. Right. The mountain is there and Jesus created it. And he, he tells he has the nerves to tell, uh, tell us to speak to the mountain. Let me give you what Jesus was talking about up until this point. Jesus had just got through cursing a fig tree. A couple of days before this, Jesus walked up to a fig tree and it was green and it was it looked good. But when he walked up on it, it was without figs. And the Bible says, and I always wonder, why did Jesus curse the fig tree? 
You know, why did he speak life? And then we saw figs come out of it. Right. We see figs. That would have been a great miracle. Right. I believe Jesus. One, one thing that I can only understand why he did it is to show the negative effects of what words do. Right. So Jesus cursed the fig tree. A couple of days later, the Bible says that the fig tree was withering. It actually was dying. The disciples asked, uh, reminded Jesus, Jesus, is that the fig? That's the fig tree you cursed a couple of days ago. And then Jesus began to go into this verse. He says, truly, I tell you, anyone who says to the mountain. Now, the mountain can figuratively represent your problem. Right. It can represent our problem. It can represent your depression. What's going on with you? And why would Jesus tell the mountain, which is protons, neutrons, and electrons, which is atoms, why would he say speak to the mountain if it didn't have an ear? You speak to things that has ears. And many times the mountain is speaking to you anyway. It's telling you that you ain't going to make it. It's telling you you ain't going to never get married, never going to have this, never going to have that. Right? It's speaking. Jesus is telling you to speak back to it. Now, I believe that we can help our brother, fellow brothers and sisters. It is not just our job to speak to our mountain. It's also the job of our brothers and sisters. If you see your brother and sister struggling to speak to their mountain as well. Amen. And we're going to get into more of that today. Your mountain has ears. Creation responds to God's word. Now, have y'all been hearing this term floating around called manifesting? Manifesting. I'm manifesting. Have y'all heard of that term going around in the world? I'm manifesting. I manifested it. Now, um, the concept, if we look here, Jesus said, have faith in God, anyone. The King James says, whosoever. There are concepts that the world would snatch. Now, this is what's wrong with the church, is they are label everything demonic, which there are principles that I believe the world get a hold to that works. And I believe those principles are derived from God. Anything that always work is truth. Right. It, it's true. It always works. You can work this principle and then we'll be honest with you, whether you save or not. Because there are certain gravity. It don't matter if you're a Christian or not. <laughs> gravity, gravity, do not discriminate whether you black, white, rich, poor. That is a principle that never changes. God created that law in the world and it ain't going and everyone, everyone must respect it. So there are things, and you hear, my, my, my son came home one time talking about, uh, <laughs> he talking about what y'all call the reap what you sow when, oh yeah, that's what he said. He said, um, you know, karma in the working. I said, karma, all that is, is Jesus said, you reap what you sow. He said, you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life. That is a principle that came from God. Relabeled, rebadged, and somebody else took it. Right? That principle in the Bible. Been existing. If it's true, it's been around since the beginning. It's been around since the beginning. Right? It's a law that works. And they done called, my son called karma, her. I'm like, man, this is in the Bible. Karma is not her. This is a principle in the scriptures. And many times the, the enemy are used, and this is, the enemy don't have power. Let me give y'all this revelation. The enemy don't have the strength or the power to overcome God, right? But God has given us ability and power placed on the inside of us. So if he can deceive us, into submitting our power and our gifts, which is gifts are God's power encapsulated. And every one of us have gifts. And if God, if the enemy can convince you and deceive you so he can use your power for his own selfish reason, he is going to do that. The only thing the enemy has is deception. 
He wants to deceive you to submit your power to God to the him so that he can use that to further deceive his agenda in this world. He has no power, but only the power that you give him. He's counting on you to be ignorant of what God has placed on the inside of you. Amen. So God in laws and rules, there is abilities. And if you live within those rules and laws, you benefit from the rule. Right. You benefit from the law like sowing and reaping. That is a benefit. Right. That you will reap from. Good or bad. Amen. Let's keep moving forward. So you got people manifesting, you know, they manifesting, they saying things, they speaking things. And the Lord uh, called us to believe. He didn't call us to manifest. Amen. He called us to believe. We, that means we submit our wills to God. This is it. This Lord gave me a revelation that was so powerful. You have a need that need to be met, right? I encourage you to stop praying that God meet the need and start praying God's will about the need. So what is God's will concerned in the need? Come on. If you got a need, what is God's will concerning your need? It's for, for it to be met, right? He said, my God supply all your need according to his riches and glory. The best thing for you to do is to pray the will of God. It's to pray the will of God, not what you want, because most Christians, this is what a lot of people do. They pray for stuff, right? They pray for things, but they never pray about themselves and growing. Like, this is some of the things that, I, that I've done. I've, I said, Lord, when I first got saved, I, I was thinking about a person in the church that I didn't want to be like. Because, you know, I, sometimes we run from Jesus because we don't want to be like the worst representative of Jesus, right? You got that worst representative of Jesus in your mind. I don't want to be like that, Lord. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be, try to, you try to be incognito Christian and just be, you know, I'm going to just be a good person. But Jesus, he, he, he had, I start asking him, Lord, I want to be effective. If this power works, if this really works, you say we can speak to the mountain. I want to see it move, Lord. Right? I, I mean, either it's true or not, you know? Like, and so I, Instead of praying for a house or a car, pray about yourself. Like if you really believe God answer prayers, then he would love to change you. Right. Amen. Way more than you have in a house, even though that's a need and all that. But many people got the American dream in their mind and they're using principles in God's word to get what they want. You know why? Because they still mean to their wife. They mean to their kids. When you can easily pray that God change your character. That's how I know you really don't want God. Because he can change you. He can, he can rearrange your thinking. Right? He can, and this is what I, the Bible says, um, John 15 he said, abide in my words, and my words abide in you. You can ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And then he said, hearing my, hearing my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And I tie verse 8 to verse 7 because we should be praying about bearing fruit. If that, if that prayer and those words are true, we should be praying about, Lord, I want to be effective for you. I want to be like Christ. I want to burn for you. Lord, change me. I don't like this aspect of myself. You know, your failure is supposed to help you humble yourself and submit yourself to God. This is why God allow your failures to continue to exist in your life even after you get saved, because your failure is supposed to produce a humility in you that you know you can't live without Jesus unless he changed you. Your failures produce a humility, not your failures. Is it supposed to produce a, a, a level of comfort like God just love me and I can just stay the same? That is interpreting the scriptures from a fleshly point of view. 
If that power set uh, the woman with the issue of blood free, that power want to set you free. If that power can set the blind, the blind uh, leopards, he, he want to set you free. Amen. So God's power want to set us free. All right, let's keep moving forward. Yes, Lord. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Let's slowly read this for a second. Therefore, whoever hears, when the last time have you heard? Now, we know Jesus was alive then and his disciples was there. And he, but he said, he didn't say whoever reads. Whoever hears these words. That's a big difference. That's why I encourage you to read, yes, but also read out loud so you can hear it. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says, therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Man, that's amazing. The Lord wants us to practice. You know, anything that requires practice requires discipline. Anything that requires discipline, there's a lot of action that you're going to have to do without feeling like doing it. Right? Discipline is doing what needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. Right? And so as we learn the skill of applying what we hear from Jesus, right, that's, that has to be a skill. You can't just become hearers only. But you know what Jesus wants? He desires, the same, he desires that his word affects you the same way his word affected this dark world when he said, let there be light. How God spoke light into existence, this world into existence, the animals into existence. He wants to allow, he wants you to desire that his word be spoken to you and put into practice so you can be stable and consistent, right? Just like the sun going up, going down for year after year after year, and we can set a time to it. Why? Because that sun coming up and down is, is motivated, energized by the word of the living God. And the same power that energized the sun to rise and fall in the moon and the night and day, God desires that power to live in you. Amen? Because he knows that the rain is coming. The rain comes on the good and the bad. And verse 25 says, the rain came down, streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. For it was found, it, it had its foundations upon the rock. And many times when we go into trying to allow Jesus to build our life through his word, the title is Words, the Building Blocks of Life. Sometimes the Lord has to demolish what we currently built. This is why there is a there is a I believe that I believe it with all my heart. When the Lord is renovating, things do not look normal. When the Lord is tearing out, deconstructing, you know he's a carpenter, right? He wants to deconstruct, right? Because it's something that was built that he didn't input into your life. And sometimes when he deconstructing, pulling things out, knocking things over, making, making a mess, to be honest with you. When it, when it look, have you ever seen a place being renovated? It looked like they don't know what they're doing at first, right? What are y'all doing? Dust everywhere, dirt everywhere, I, things look out of order. But it must, he has to take out things that wasn't never supposed to be in your life in the first place. This is why sometimes it's the will of God that everything look chaotic. Mm -hmm. 
because he is renovating. He is deconstructing so he can construct. A bad carpenter cover over junk, hide, hide flaws, right? To make it look like everything. Oh, man, this was wonderful. But beneath the surface, there are things that God did never call to be in the schematics of your house. Jesus referenced us to houses. He said, when an unclean spirit leaves your house and he finds a place. So God wants to not only build you up, but he wants to tear some things down first so he can't build what's necessary. Why? Because the wind is going to blow. The rain is coming. Right. And God desires that when the wind blows, your house will not fall. All right. When the storm comes, storms are designed to reveal where you at as a believer. It's designed to expose uh, your true uh, knowledge of what you really know, just like a test. A test is it exposes what you really know. Right. And if the house continues to fall and that should be an indicator that it might not be founded on a rock. The rock is, Jesus said, anyone who hears these sayings of mine is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Jesus' words is one ingredient. Your accepting Jesus' words is the second ingredient. And the third ingredient is doing what Jesus say is the foundation. We can't just come to church and be hearers only. We have it. Why are you sitting in that seat? Lord, I do it. Lord, I do it. Teach me. I know. I, I know. That I don't feel like doing it. I don't want. I really don't want to do it. But commit to make decision to do what Jesus say. As you are listening, as the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart on, the, on, 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 on this topic, he might, I might be talking about, I'm talking about atoms and cells, and he might be dealing with you about stuff that you need to do with that friend that keep calling, decisions you need to make. Decide. Why? Because he is trying to build your house on a rock. He is trying, he is trying to prepare you for the storm. You cannot grow if you don't have resistance. Resistance has to be a part of the plan for your life. Opposition is needed to develop and to grow. Pressure has to be applied to you for your own development. Amen? All right. All right. We're going to do a little exercise for altar call. It's going to be good. It's going to be really good. All right. We've got a couple more scriptures, and then we'll get into it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage, admonish, exhort one another, and edify. Edify in the Amplified says, strengthen and build up one another, just as you are doing. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, in a new new, new, new NIV, he says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be heartened by sin's deceitfulness. It is a part of our mandate as believers to encourage our brothers. There is power being released to you when you choose to encourage. Now, one definition of prophesy means to edify, to build up, and, to, and words of, through words of comfort, all right? Edify means to build up. It's to build up. And so many of us have to develop this skill of encouraging one another daily, right? We're, we've been trained to encourage ourselves and, it's, you know, it seems as if encouraging yourself don't work as good as in when somebody else encouraged you. How many of y'all try to encourage yourself? We have to, right? It is, I, listen, you're not there when we're in the car, right? You're not there when I wake up in the midnight hour. I have to encourage myself. I have to be there for myself. I say things to myself, right? 
But then there comes a place where when somebody else comes and encourage you, especially by the spirit, man, those, there, those words hit a little different than the words from yourself. Amen. And we know David had to encourage himself when everybody was out to get him, when he had made some, it looked like he made some mistakes. But the Bible says that we ought to encourage. When the last time you spoke encouraging, that's, that means to impart courage to your brother. Because you are, and the enemy, have, he'll convince you of this, that you're the only one. He'll have you looking at other people who look like they're successful. Everybody's successful but me. That is a common thing in the church and in, in people's lives. You'll be amazed who is struggling. You'll be amazed. Right? You'll be amazed. If you had my mind, you'll be amazed what the thoughts that come into my mind about myself and about my environment, and about the church and about people. Just the enemy just will, his attempt is to discourage you. There are, there are specific devils that are, they are, they are straight up assigned to you to discourage you about one area. And then it'll just harass you about that one area for years and years and years and years, and we get used to its voice. And one of the things that I want to do as a pastor is to reverse the effects of that. I already know if he's doing me like that, he's, he's doing you as well. It, you don't have to be super spiritual. You just know that this is the agenda of the enemy to discourage. So by going to your brother and your sister and saying, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Keep pressing. It's going to be all right. The Lord is going to overcome this. Those problems in your life don't have to. And then the Lord will begin to give prophetic words. What I mean, there are things that's going to be said that seem like you just know information about them. And they're like, how you know? How you know? How we know? But you, if you never put in a position to encourage, you never, get, you never allow the Holy Spirit to use you in that way. Because many times we're not, we're not, if we don't put ourselves in a position where we're encouraging one another daily, we doubt when the Lord speaks to us without the encouragement. Sometimes the Lord done spoke to you in this sanctuary to go say something to somebody or go or speak a word into their life, and you doubt that the Lord. Listen to me. It ain't going to hurt nobody that you go encourage somebody. It is never... I wonder if that you don't have to ever wonder if that's God. You don't have to ever. Is that you, Lord? It don't have to be him. It's already written. Have you encouraged somebody today? The Bible tells us to encourage one another daily. Amen. So we know that the Lord do give us specifics, but sometimes we question God because we don't want to do what he say. We doubt that he's speaking to us because we have, we, we, this is so good. We have ideas about ourselves that not been, that's, that's not came from him. And my job as your pastor is to reverse the effects of that. Yes. 